Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, what generational curses has God given you the power by his grace to have broken off your life? <laughs> You're like, man, all right, just gonna just dive in, preacher. I was thinking about this, and I was, I've been so blessed as a pastor to see so many of you, by God's grace, see complete generational shift in your life. I was thinking some of you guys that for many generations, alcoholism was just part of your family line. And it was something that was in your family, so you just continued with it. But then there became a point in your life, and you're like, I can't keep on going down this road and seeing the wreckage that happens from me being taken over and dominated by alcohol. And you're like, God, can you just, can you do something in my life? And you surrendered your life to him. He gave you power that you never had. No program ever was able to give you, no halfway house, no nothing, but the power of the living God gave you freedom from alcohol, and you're a different person. And the beauty is, you change, that generational curse that was over your family for decades and years and years and years is now gone in the name of Jesus, and you are blazing a new path. And I'm just, I'm just so, it's like one of my favorite things to see. Some in this room, it wasn't alcoholism, it was divorce. And that's just the way it was for generations and generations. And in on, if you're really honest, you were growing up with fear going, oh my goodness, could it ever be different in my life? Because you grew up wetting the bed and you grew up with insecurity and you grew up in, in just, man, what's gonna happen tomorrow? And then by God's grace, he got control of your life. And you're like, no more big D in this family. By God's grace, we're gonna stay together. Can I be really frank with you and honest? Last night, my, golly, dude. What the, my son and I, last night, were renovating a kitchen. And I just stopped for a second. I was like, man, I just, I just wanna tell you, Son, like this is, this is a blast for me to be able to do what we get to do together. And he was training me, like he's been training me, like doing backsplashes together and putting in ovens and refrigerators and it's a blast, man. And I told, I was real honest with him. I don't, I, I was honestly had a lot of fear raising the kids, wondering if I was able to make it. But God. <laughs> but God. Some of you guys, I thought of this. I don't know who this is for. You grew up in a highly critical family. Your family had the gift of criticism. Every restaurant you went to, every church you went to, every business you went to, the first thing your family sniffed out was what was wrong. And you didn't, ha and it was like, I don't have a choice. I'm just gonna continue to walk in this gift of criticism. And then somewhere, somehow, God freed you by his grace. And now you're walking not in legalism and criticism, but in freedom to believe the best and to, and to pour out grace to the people that are in process just like you. Oh my goodness, is that good news? I was like, oh! So many of us, generational curses have been broken. But if we're really honest, some of us are still struggling right now in that very thing, and it feels like you can't even get out. And the list goes on. It's, I thought about this this way. There's so many good things that were given to us growing up. I can, I can praise God for diligence, and discipline. I, I'm looking at my parents in the third row right here. I watched my, my parents take over a book business in their 40s. Was it 40s? 50s. And I saw them up at two in the morning 
getting all these books all ready to go and like no excuses. And my stepdad, he was kind of a little OCD, but he always had the little systems in place. And I'm like, dude, that's the guy I want to be right there. And, and it's interesting. So you, so you get some of this good, but if you're really honest, you're kind of getting a little And it's interesting because you can kind of go the other way, overeating, overspending, over, and, and, and anxiety and fear. And, and so it's like, whose fault is that, by the way? You ever notice that? Like, is it my fault? Like, can I just blame my parents for all the bad stuff in my life? <laughs> can I just, uh, sorry, I just, that's just, that's just my life. I'm going to be an adulterer. I'm going to be a fornicator. I'm going to be a drinker. That's just who I am. And this wild thing in Israel, that was what was happening. There was this proverb and God like put his foot down in this passage. He's like, no more of that, dude. And the parable was this. Uh, the parents ate some sour grapes, but the kids are the ones that are actually affected by it. And so as I want just an illustration for him. Can I just see those grapes, please? Thank you very much. Um, family in here. We got a family in the front row. You want to participate, Kyle? Could you do this real quick, please? Real quick. Thanks, dude. I know you're a healthy guy, so I, these are sour grapes, okay? okay. What I want you to do um, is just, just take one real quick. Just take a bite of one real quick. And it's sour. Like, just, I'm just, okay, just eat it. No, eat, I want you to eat the whole thing. Thank you. It's good. This is my trainer, by the way, so it's just all good. We're, we're bonding right here. <laughs> Paying him back for all those hellish workouts he puts me through. <laughs> Sour. So just give me a... Just give me, oh, just give me, oh, oh, oh. Okay, now, now his son, Coda, let me ask you a question, Coda. How, do you taste what he's eating right now? No? No taste at all. Nothing? You sure? You're not affected by what he's eating right now. So you have your own choice on what you're going to eat. Do you want to eat sour grapes? No. You want the Krispy Kreme donut? Yeah. I just happen to have another one right here. There you go. There you go. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for participating. Let's give it up for the Kyle and Coda show. It's really good. <laughs> oh man. Let's just get right into it because I want you to see this. Ezekiel 18, starting in verse 1. Another message came to me from the Lord. Why do you quote this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes but their children's mouths pucker at the taste. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, you will not quote this proverb anymore in Israel. In other words, you cannot make this excuse anymore. Verse four, for all people are mine to judge. Isn't that a refreshing thing? You don't have to, you don't have to keep on judging everybody. Just let the Lord judge people. You can stop. Both parents and children alike and this is my rule. Here it is. If you don't get anything else from this message, here, here's the summation verse right here. The person who sins is the one who will die. You're like, awesome. What, what, what are we trying to say? If you're a note taker, number one, write it down, responsibility. God is saying, okay, people of Israel, stop making excuses for your own choice in life. And let me just try to tactfully say this. As hard as it is sometimes to get away from what has been passed down from you and I, at the end of the day, you and I have been given free will choice to make a change in our life. So, so that is the key to this entire message. And God's like, no more of that. You cannot continue to say that. You can make your own path. You can change. And isn't it interesting though, like from day one, like humans, we just like making excuses, don't we? When, you know, when God created man, he put him in the garden. He's like, yo, you can have whatever you want. Stay away from that. And then what ended up happening? 
And Eve gets, you know, duped into taking the forbidden fruit and then gives it to her husband. It's so funny because later on they were taking a walk with God. They're starting to hide from God. And God's like, yo, what'd you do? And he comes to Adam, by the way, men. He comes to you to see how you're leading the family. And he comes to Adam. What, did, what was Adam's response? Hey, man, that was the chick that you gave me, man. It's all her fault. Right? And then God looks to Eve, and what did Eve say? Hey, man, it wasn't my fault. It was the, it was the serpent's fault. I think from day one, we just want to blame. And, and it's interesting. Just recently, I had one of my good friends get up in my face. I had, I had uh, over, I didn't do something that I, I should have, I should have put it in my calendar. I missed it. And I was kind of, I was trying to do a little bit of, you know, I don't know, I, I don't, is it really my fault? I kind of just missed it. He, he just looked at me. He's like, let's just call a spade a spade, man. You, you messed up. And I had to, I had to just humble myself almost in tears and be like, you're right. Thank you for being a good friend who's not patty caking me, but telling me the truth. You're wrong, Todd. How about if today you and I, we walk away instead of trying to shoot fingers at my parents, my grandparents, the pastor, the president, or, and how about we just look at us in the mirror and go, you know what? It was my fault could be the most freeing, liberating thing you could ever say, or I could ever say. I, you know what? It's my fault. My fault. He says, the, the soul that sins shall die. We've been talking about this a lot. Romans 6, 23 says this, the wages of sin is death. But I got good news, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, the fact is we were walking in generational curse and that pathway was going to lead to death. But by God's grace, he started knocking on our heart. The Holy Spirit was, was reaching out to us. We responded. And what happened? I came to Christ. I'm forgiven right there. And that free gift now is he breaks generational curses. He is the only one. You can go on a pill. You can go do all this kind of stuff. But I'm going to tell you one way. It's God's spirit through Christ that breaks all curses in our life. We humble ourselves. Now, why were the people of God making this excuse? When God was giving the law through Moses in Exodus 20, they got confused. And I want you to read this. Exodus 20 in verse five, the second half of five says, I lay the sins of the parents. Check this out. This is pretty wild. The sin of the parents eating the grapes upon their children. This hit me. The entire family is affected. Even children in the, four, in the third and fourth generations of those, but here it is, who reject me. That's where they got it off. They just, they just said, well, the third and fourth generations, it's just going to come down and I don't have a choice. No, it's, it's the third and fourth generation that continue to walk in the same sin and reject God and his ways. That is actually the context of the scripture. They took it out of context and made up excuses and said it's all the parents' fault. But look at verse six, but I lavish, oh, it's so good. You know the Lord wants to lavish something in your life if you'll just let him become Lord? I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations. You talk about turning the tide in your generational curse. A thousand generations on those who love me and what? And obey my commands. Oh, that's so good. He's waiting did you know God's not, he's not waiting to beat you up. He's waiting to bless you. He's like, yo, I made you. I know how life works. I gave you this game plan, the written word. I'm just waiting, you to walk, waiting for you to walk into it and just admit it. And I want to bless you. Like this dude, look at verse five. So cool. Check this out. Verse five, Exodus 18. Suppose a certain man is righteous. He does what is just and right. He does not feast in the mountains before Israel's idols or worship them. He does not commit adultery or have intercourse with a woman during her menstrual period. That's in the Bible. I'm just reading the Bible. Sorry. Verse seven. He's a merciful creditor, not keeping the items given as security by poor debtors. He does not rob the poor, but instead gives food to the hungry and provides clothes for the needy. He grants loans without interest, stays away from injustice, honest, fair when judging others. 
and faithfully obeys my decrees and regulations. Anyone who does these things, check this out, is just and will what? He will surely, says the sovereign Lord, live. I think about the heritage, I think about my mom's mom, and I hear stories passed down to me about how there would be people that were uh, less fortunate in their surrounding neighborhood, and my grandma, who loved God, who followed the Lord, would go out of her way to make sure she would take some of my mom's dad's clothing and go bless some of the guys in the neighborhood that were struggling financially. And I just see like this picture of my mom and that was passed down from her mom to her and she, she's lived this. To this day, I, I just love honoring my mom. It's God through her. But when you walk into Love Church, she's one of the first people just to give you a hug. She, she just doesn't know any better. She, it's just the Lord flowing through her. Hey, hey, sweetheart, like, is this lady for real? Like, people are like, oh, she's cheesy, she's making it up. That's just who he, she is. Why? Because God has flowed through her her entire life. Is she perfect? No, okay. I'll tell you some of her sins later. But right now, I'm just telling you, like, she lives it. John 10:10 10, 10 in the NIV, I love this. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Listen, generational curses, it comes through the form of, of repetitive sin that the enemy puts in our face. We take it and we live it out. And the, and the, and the fruit of it is destruction and chaos. But what did Jesus say? But I came, ha <laughs> ha, that they may have life and have it to the, ooh, that's good news. To the full. He wants to give life to the full, but he loves us so much he gave us free will. And I can either say, you know what, I'm gonna stay into this generational curse thing, this lifestyle of sin, or I'm gonna be like, put my foot down, no more of that. I'm going a different direction. Yeah, it's, one or two, it's one of those two choices. And it's this, this is getting more and more important as we go. And I'm sorry, a little bit, I'm just a little hype and OCD, a little bit crazy today, but I'm just, I'm trying to be who I am and trying to help people. That's all I'm trying to do. It hit me really hard this week. This whole idea of there is a way that is right. There is a God. He created us for a relationship with him. He gave us a playbook. We walk it out and we obey his instruction. We live life to the full. It's not well, just kind of do whatever you want, and what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me. That is one of the biggest lies the enemy has showed in this culture. It's called moral relativism. The problem is we're seeing the fruit of that right now, and we need to make a choice as humanity what we're gonna do about it. I'll give you one example. I saw a story. A teenage girl in Israel who's being interviewed Someone from Hamas broke into her grandmother's home, murdered her in cold blood because they thought they were doing what is right that Allah told them to do, killed the grandma, took the grandma's phone, videoed the grandma, and put it on her Facebook page from her phone because that was what's right to them. If we walk through moral relativism, we have to agree with that then. What's right for you is right for you. So that's okay to have a grandmother laying in blood and her, and her grandchild is on Facebook seeing her grandma in cold blood on her own Facebook page. And I know I just had to go, I had to get real for a second because we cannot continue down this road. What's true is for you, what's true... There is absolute truth. There is a God who is clean, he is pure, he is holy, and there is a devil that is evil and influencing people. We gotta make a decision. What camp am I in? The Bible says you're either for me or you're against me. And I hate to be raising my voice, but I'm just trying to be honest, man. I'm, it pains my heart. The, the fruit of just continuing down this road, it doesn't have to be like that. So, he gives this example, this person's walking the right way, <laughs> but then to show that we all have choice, look at verse 10. But suppose that man, this righteous dude, he's living the right, right life, he's doing it the right way, following God, his plan. 
But suppose that man has a son who grows up to be a robber or a murderer and refuses to do what is right. None of you parents have any of those type of kids, but I'm just giving you an example, maybe. And that son does all the evil things his father would never do or his mother would never do. He worships idols on the mountains, commits adultery, oppresses the poor and helpless, steals from debtors by refusing to let them redeem their security, worships idols, commits detestable sins, and lends money at excessive interest. Should such a sinful person live? No, he must die and must take what? Full blame. This is a picture of me. My mom lives this great example. I'm like, no, I'm gonna do whatever I want. Let me set some parents free real quick, by the way. You have not been perfect, but by God's grace, have lived a biblical lifestyle. You've been a great example to your kids, but you're under this guilt right now, and you're like, oh my goodness, I led my kid astray. Can I just tell you something? Some of your kids will just be crazy. <laughs> Don't matter how good of an example you have been, some kids will just be crazy. I was one of them. And this great example is set by my mom, loving God, loving people. Hey, Toddy, don't do that. It's not gonna be good for you. Yeah, whatever, mom, you don't know what you, what, ah, you're lame, I'm gonna be cool. Really? You're gonna crash your life is what you're gonna do. And notice this, such a sinful person, should they live? No, they must die, must take full blame. That gets to be heavy. And we misrepresent the heart of God because we say God's just out to kill you when you get out of line which is incorrect. I believe that for years. It's incorrect. The greatest illustration I heard about this was uh, this guy I looked up to, his name's John Corson, and he, <laughs> he tells this story about he used to have a problem with moles in his, in his yard. And uh, so they, you know what moles, I think the guys that they make little holes in your yard or whatever, and so he had to make these poison pellets to kill off these stinking moles. The problem was he'd put the poisonous pellet in the hole, but his kids liked to play out in the backyard. And so he would look at his kids and very sternly say, hey guys, I'm putting poison there, right there, okay? Like you cannot go and eat the the poison, they were like peanuts. He would like lace them with something, I don't know, but like the poisonous peanuts, like you cannot go there or you will die. Do you got it, kids? So here's the thing, though. Like, I love that illustration. God's saying, if you walk down this road, you will die. He didn't say, I will kill you. You'll kill yourself by the poisonous peanuts. And that was my story. Like, I, I'm walking down eating all kinds of poisonous peanuts, like just killing my life. And my mom's like, poor mom, I'm like, didn't I tell you about the poisonous peanuts? What are you doing? <laughs> Let me also say this. You are a child or you're a teenager or you're a young person. And your parents have really done a great job modeling what it is to follow God. But if you're really honest, you're kind of just riding the coattails right now of your parents' faith. Can I just lovingly say that doesn't work, man? It's, it's, it's a person, that's why it's a personal relationship with God through Christ. It's our own free will coming to this place and going, you know what? I don't care what the world is telling me. I don't care what my parents might have been great, but I have to make a decision how I'm gonna live my life and who I'm gonna follow right now. The time is now. Jesus said this in verse eight, because again, God's people had this twisted a bit about their lineage. They said this, don't just say to each other, Luke three and eight, don't just say to each other, we're, we're safe. Hey, we're descendants of Abraham. We have this generational blessing. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can can create children of Abraham from these very stones. He's like, yo, man, like this is between you and God. Your parents might have been a great influence. Your grandparents, they might have been a terrible influence. But at the end of the day, that's not an excuse. Your parents didn't eat the grapes and you're tasting it. 
You have your own choice to make. I have my own choice to make. What is it going to be? How are we going to walk through this? So you got exhibit A, dude that's, you know, living the righteous life. Has a kid, the kid just blows it. So what do you think about number three kid, verse 14? But suppose that sinful son, in turn, has a son who sees his father's wickedness and watch this, decides, someone say decides, decides against that kind of life. This son refuses to worship idols on the mountains, does not commit adultery, does not exploit the poor, instead is fair to debtors, does not rob them, gives food to the hungry, provides clothes for the needy, he helps the poor, does not lend money at interest, obeys all my regulations and decrees. Such a person will not die because of his father's sins. Ding, 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 ding. He will surely live, but the father will die for his many sins, for being cruel, robbing people, doing what is clearly wrong among his people. This is so interesting to me because I've seen this actually several times with even some of my good friends where I've seen both. I've seen some that are literally nearing 50 years of age, which, by the way, that's coming close to me, by the way. It's just wild to think. Your boy is almost of a half century. That's so crazy to think. Cap was like, really? Like, so, that's why I have you young guys around to try to keep me. But I'm nearing 50, and I see dudes that are about my age, and they're still making excuses about their current life decisions on their parents or grandparents. But you know what? I also see the opposite. If anyone would have an excuse to make about how they were raised and where they should be, one of my best friends is one of the most successful people and most gracious and generous person on the planet. And he grew up in a chaotic place. And it doesn't make any sense for him to be where he's at today where one of the richest guys in the world texts him talking about, hey man, let's go out to dinner. He could have just said, you know what? I make excuses for where I came. And he said, you know what? Bump that. Comes to Christ. He's the first one in the office, the last one to leave. The guy is disciplined, diligent, gracious. And now over the several years of consistency, God has blown up through his life and he's made a difference in, in many, many people's lives, including yours. It's true. And we've seen it time again. Remember King Josiah? One of my favorite kings in the Old Testament. We studied little King Josiah. By the way, he becomes the king when he's like eight. That'd be dope. Like, I'm going to run for president. I'm eight years old. <laughs> Did you know when you study King Josiah that the deck was stacked against him too? He could have made a, a total excuse. Manasseh, his granddaddy, was one of the most wicked kings of Israel ever. His dad, Ammon, followed after the grandpa, was also evil. And then little Josiah, at eight years old, changes the game. He's like, I'm going to break the generational curse. I'm going to be someone different. And you know what the key of the whole thing was? This, this dude, uh, he was in the temple that was all wrecked. He finds the law, the rules of God, the, the playbook of life. He comes back. I think it was Shaphan the scribe. Starts reading it, and Josiah's like, oh, snap. Let's get back to God's way. And a revival breaks out from the people of God through the scriptures, which is exactly what's happening right here. Some of y'all are reading the scripture for the very first time. You grew up religious, but never in relationship. Now you're cracking open the word and God's speaking to you, even in the Old Testament prophets. <laughs> Blows me away, but God, I look at you, man, you're a perfect example of that. Don't make any excuses for how you were raised or abused as a child. Man, that was terrible, and I hate seeing that kind of stuff in humanity. But man, you're breaking generational curses right now in the name of Jesus. His power through you. Punching the pulpit. Never done that before. I'm sorry. There's so much to this. Write down number two. So we all have a responsibility. Number two, result. I'm just going to read this section for a second. Ezekiel 18, verse 19. What, you ask? Doesn't, because some of us are asking the question, doesn't the child pay for the parent's sins? No. Are you affected? Yes, tragically, I'm sorry. 
we're affected, but we don't wallow in that. We don't stay in that. The child does what is just and right and keeps my decrees. That child will truly live. We have a choice. We can turn. The person who sins is the one who will die. A child will not be punished for the parent's sins. Let me pause. There's a child in here right now, and you're wondering that right now. You're asking the question, is there any way that I can grow up different from my parents? And it's not to judge your parents. By the way, let me just say this. Some of you guys stop judging your parents because they're lost right now. You need to pray for them, not, not, not throw them in jail. Forgive, pray for them, walk out humility right now. The Bible says that there, many of them are trapped by the enemy doing his will without even knowing it. The child will not be punished for the parent's sin, and the parent will not be punished for the child's sins. Righteous people will be rewarded for their own righteous behavior. Wicked people will be punished for their own wickedness. But if wicked people turn away from all their sins and begin to obey my decrees and do what is just and right, they will surely live and not die. That's you in here who have been walking in generational curse and sin. The Bible says if you turn right now, you'll be freed, bro. Like the, the result, you'll be free. Forgiven and free, free, free. 22, all their past sins will be forgotten and they'll live because of the righteous things they've done. What Christ has done, really. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, Psalm 103, verse 12, he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. That's good news. You, you are stuck right now in generational sin, generational curse alcoholism, abuse, overspending, overeating, anxiety, fear has crippled you. There's something that has been just passed on to you and you're like, is there any way? Listen, don't make an excuse, turn. Turn. It's possible. How do we break off these curses? Finally, number three, repent. <laughs> you thought I was gonna bring something new. I think repent's been in the message, like every single message that I've preached, and you're like, can, can I just leave? The, I want people to tell me it's all good. I can continue to do what I'm doing. I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. If you want God's best right here, the key right now to break generational curses is repentance. And repentance is this. I've been walking the way that my parents and grandparents, I've just, they, I'm just walking in their footsteps. I've seen the fruit of it. It's not what I wanna do. I'm gonna turn and go the other way. And it says it right here. Verse 28, I just wanna read it. Ezekiel 18 and 28. They will live, you will live, and I will live. That's been my story. They will live because, <laughs> this is so wild. They thought it over and decided to turn from their sins. Such people will not die. Verse 30, therefore I will judge each of you, O people of Israel, according to your actions, says the sovereign Lord. Repent and turn from your sins. Don't let them destroy you. Oh my goodness. I just gotta go back to that. Hold on, can you go back to 28 real quick? This is so good. And I want all of us to do this. If you're stuck in generational sin right now, here's the key. They live, why? They, they got out of it. They changed complete trajectory of their life and the generations to come. Why? They thought it over and decided to turn. It's so crazy. So if you're stuck in alcoholism right now, here's what I would say. Get out a piece of paper or a pen later this week and just write out the fruit of getting drunk all the time. Just write it out. Again, nothing wrong with having a drink or two as long as you're not getting weight, intoxicated. The Bible has, has, doesn't say anything about having a drink or two and enjoying life. Nothing wrong with that. When we get intoxicated, we, or you have a temptation. You, you know you have a drink or two and all of a sudden your decisions start getting off of God's best. I would propose maybe write it down and go, hmm, maybe not the best choice. Whatever it is, whatever it is, overspending, overeating. Listen, I'm working through my own different challenges in life. I, I'm doing the same thing. I write down the fruit of some of my decisions that I've brought from the past. Write it down. Think it over. Is that what I want? 
No. I got good news. You can turn. Now we're going to the New Testament. I'm just going to read a lot of Bible. I'm going to tell one story and then I'm going to let you go. Go to Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to give you the first one. And I'm going to give you a phrase. I say this when I wake up in the morning, not out of religiosity, but out of truth. I say, kill me, fill me, and send me. Every day. I, the key to me of breaking generational curses is kill me. Get Todd's way to do life, my, ten, my, my tendencies. We all have propensity to sin in different areas. God, kill that part of me Fill me with the spirit and let me go some other direction. And Galatians 6, 8 says this. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature. How many have been there? Man, I've been there, right? I wake up and I just, I'm just, whatever I, I, I'm hungry, whatever feels good to me, I'm just gonna go that direction. This is what it says. We will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit. And then go to Galatians 5, verse 16. This is a lot of text. I'm just gonna let God speak today. You guys ready just to let God speak to your soul? Paul writing to the area of churches in Galatia. This is what he says, the key. You wanna break generational curses. Here it is right here. So I say, church, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Not the Holy Siri, not the Holy Instagram, not you know, a news station. Let Holy Spirit guide your lives then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. And don't look at me like your sinful nature doesn't crave something that you know ain't right, because I'm with you. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces, the generational curse and what, what, what your sinful desire wants, and the spirit, they're constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you're directed by the spirit, you're not under the obligation to the law of Moses. Now here's, here's, here's would be a list of what you could write down when you stop and you and I stop and think about this generational curse and the result of it. When you follow, verse 19, the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger. You ever see that in your family? Selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I had before, anyone living that sort of life, that type of repetitive life, will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is God's word, not Todd's word. But I got good news, look at 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. You guys ready for this? Write this list down too. Love, joy, peace, patience, come on, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, is that just good news? Write the list down. There's no law against these things. It's our choice. Last story. Ah, isn't it crazy how time flies? Some of you are like, no, dude. Like, I've been like, bro, I'm hungry. Stop with all this talk. I'll end with this, with an opportunity. Actually, let, let me just pray. And then we'll conclude. God, thanks for um, really just challenging us today. Your scripture's clear. I, I, hear, I see your heart in this text, and it's a heart for your kids. You, you want the best for them. And there's some of us that we just need to stop making excuses and just own up to it and ask for your power to help us, just to turn. I know I have areas that, to this day, 
I battle and I just wanna give them to you and say, God, I just, wanna, I just want your best. Kill me, get me out of the way. Fill me with your spirit. I wanna see a total shift in generations and generations to come following you. Not perfect, but saved by the blood of Christ, filled with the power of the spirit. Experiencing your best for your glory. In Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I want to just give an opportunity to respond. And <laughs> this story is so crazy. There, in the Philippines, there was these these monkeys. <laughs> they were <laughs> oh golly, and they're greedy monkeys. They uh, causing havoc in the in the town. And the monkeys were actually a delicacy. And the way they would catch them was interesting. It was um, this coconut. They would cut like a little circle in the coconut and they would drop in it. I forget what it was. It was something they loved to eat. It was rice. It was rice. And But they would make the hole so small that the monkey would put their little hand they couldn't resist the, the rice. And they would put their hand in and they would grab the fistful of rice, but they wanted it so bad, they, tr they would try to pull it out, but they couldn't get their hand out of the darn coconut. So they would then, they, they wouldn't let go. They would just hold on to this. Then they would try to run up the tree and, and they would hit the tree with the coconut, indicating to the villagers that they caught another monkey. So they'd come in and, you know, sorry, take out the monkey and serve it on a platter as a delicacy or whatever. And you're like, what is happening here? And I just, and I just thought, you know, there's some of us that all we, all, we're holding on to something, but we're actually leading to our death. If we just repent and release whatever that rice is in our life that's leading us astray, now we're going to be free. Something's different. So let's stand together. And if there's someone in here, you go, dude, I am tired of generational curses. I, I just need to release right now. I need to turn. I want something different. If that's, in you, you, if that's you here today, the band's gonna play a song. The church is gonna be praying. This is your opportunity. God, I, I just, I'm off track. I, I just, I need something different. Will you forgive me? I wanna follow you. It happened for me in 1997. My life's forever changed. You come as the band plays. No more. This is your pivot point right here. Break them off. Break them off. Let us pray for you. You come as the band plays. You come forward. I'll lead you in prayer.